Connection is the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. Turning towards each other and being curious about the other's experience um, and knowing that, knowing that we are able to connect. Many a times, Dixon and myself, when we look at the four children, we thought that we are the one blessing them. And many times we know they are the one bringing us immense amount of blessings. 
。如果你还要那么坚持，那么执着，为了这些事情而闹闹得面红耳赤，那那也还真的是对不起大家，也对不起自己了。就就我觉得惜得啊，惜得啊，对啊，就就好好的珍惜这段呃可以做当一家人的这个缘分。缘分。Sometimes the bully was probably bullied themselves. It's very important. We want to journey with people who have experienced bullying, but I think we also want to understand, you know, why bullies bully. I kind of moved away from a traditional mindset to kind of run my own business now. It's fully attributed to whatever my dad has done in my young age. What happened to these victims is that they did not have any empowerment. Someone forced sex on them, and so the helping process must reaffirm that sense of empowerment. What I propose is upstream to create an environment, a culture、uh, whereby we can talk freely with one another, address those issues in a friendly, loving way. In order for advocacy to work, you have to work together with other people in, uh, uh, in, in, who share the same objectives or the same values. Feeling stuck、uh, in a place,、um, you actually don't know how to climb out of the hole, or you didn't know that you can actually just reach up a hand and someone might just help you by pulling you out. Find those linkages,、uh, those connections,、uh, whereby you can seek help. Something must be taken out of you, and until you address that vulnerability in a single safe space, only then could the colors be brought back into the worlds that you live in. I dream that our family will have a better future, a beautiful home for the children, the best environment we are for them. Project Lift has been helping me and my family a lot、uh, by mentoring my children, connecting us with the Key Start program. For home ownership, also help us on planning for our saving. Project Leaf is、uh, first is、uh, they help us for the financial wise. So actually, the LCSCS is、uh, helping for her find the tuition first because she's my daughter is a、um, week at max, so she find for me one sponsor for her to. Other than that, always LCSCS doing the,、uh, some sending the grocery or something. After I think the other social the one finish at the more than eight months already. I mean the one year finish after that they inform me. I think more than eight months. Also I still continue with Amanda. During my critical、uh, situation, I first I call Amanda to check is there any help for me to do this one that one. I'm asking for her to give suggestion. She give this one. You go. I go and find for you. She she's going all the way. With their innate strengths, 
Families just need the right kind of support from the community to strive to emerge strongly from their situations. Support the families through our work in our annual flagship fundraising campaign, Real Link. Real Link is a virtual conversation series where we engage with special guests to explore various topics that matter in our society. The theme is Rebuilding the Community, where we seek to reconnect with communities that have been adversely affected by societal issues, exploring what has and can be done to break the cycle of hurt. Donate by scanning the QR code that appears. All donations above $10 are eligible for a 250% tax exemption. Your donation will be eligible for one-for-one -one matching as Real Link is part of the Tote Board Enhanced Fundraising Program. Your support matters.
Hello and uh, welcome to Real Link, uh, which promotes real conversations about pertinent concerns. And Real Link is a virtual conversation series where we'll be engaging our special guests and uh, you, of course, and together we will explore various topics that matter in our society. And the theme for this year, 2021, Rebuilding the Community, where we seek to reconnect with communities that have been adversely affected by societal issues, exploring what has and can be done to break the cycle of hurt. <laughs> Now, Railing is also a campaign to raise funds to support the work that is being done by the Lutheran Community Care Services, otherwise simply known as LCCS. And as a non-profit social service agency, LCCS has been actively engaging and empowering individuals and families to build and sustain relationships. And on that point, let's watch a short video clip so we sort of get a glimpse into the work being done here at LCCS. I dream that our family will have a better future, a beautiful home for the children, the best environment we are for them. Project Lift has been helping me and my family a lot uh, by mentoring my children, connecting us with the Key Start program for home ownership also help us on planning for our saving. Project Leaf is uh, first is uh, they help us for the financial wise. So actually the LCSCS is uh, helping for her find the tuition first because she's, my daughter is a um, week at max. So she find for me one sponsor for her to... Other than that, always LCCS doing the, uh, some sending the grocery or something. After, I think the other social, the one finish at uh, more than eight months already. I mean, the one year finish after that, they inform me, I think more than eight months. Also, I still continue with Amanda. During my critical uh, situation, I first I call Amanda to check, is there any help for me to do this one, that one? I'm asking for her, she gives suggestion. She give this one, you go, I go and find for you. She, she's going all the way. With their innate strengths, families just need the right kind of support from the community to strive to emerge strongly from their situations. Support the families through our work in our annual flagship fundraising campaign, Real Link. Real Link is a virtual conversation series where we engage with special guests to explore various topics that matter in our society. The theme is Rebuilding the Community, where we seek to reconnect with communities that have been adversely affected by societal issues, exploring what has and can be done to break the cycle of hurt. Donate by scanning the QR code that appears. All donations above $10 are eligible for a 250% tax exemption. Your donation will be eligible for one-for-one -for -one matching as Real Link is part of the Toadbot Enhanced Fundraising Program. Your support matters. And so focusing on restorative practices, LCCS has served and continues to serve families, schools, institutes, residential homes and various organizations to restore relationships that have been harmed and of course in the process connecting communities together. Now, LCCS is a full member of the National Council of Social Service and has been accorded institution of a public character status. And I'm Augustine Aswan, 
And it's both my pleasure and privilege to be your host and moderator for the Railing Conversation, an online fundraising campaign alongside the speaker who will be sharing with us today, and that is Professor Chandran Kokathas. He's the Dean of the School of Social Sciences at Singapore Management University. And of course, we're coming to you live from the LCCS studios here in Singapore. Now, First of all, we want to thank you for being with us and we welcome you to this uh, Railing Virtual Conversation Series because today is Session 6, that's right, and it's entitled The Culture of Cancelling. You see, every fortnight on a Friday, we've been featuring local and international speakers who will share their perspectives on a range of topics and this series actually kicked off in June and will be running all the way to November and here at LCCS, our aim is to create a safe and meaningful space for our speakers to talk about what matters, which is why we'd like to involve you in this process and, uh, and with one another. And of course, most important of all, we want to involve you in the discussion. So please do write your comments in the comments section or you can post your questions in the comments below. And we'd also like to seek your kind-hearted donation. Uh, you can use the QR code on the bottom of your screen as well because uh, you'll be glad to know that every donation is eligible for a one-for-one -one matching as Railink is part of the Tote Board Enhanced Fundraising Program. Every donation above 10 single Singapore dollars uh, is also eligible for a 250% tax deduction. And having shared that with you, it's now my pleasure to invite uh, Professor Chandran Kukatas to kick off the culture of cancelling session. Uh, Prof, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I came across <coughs> one particular sort of definition of sorts that says cancel culture is promoting the cancelling of people, brands, and even shows and movies due to what some consider to be offensive or problematic remarks or ideologies. Now, when I first came across this, it sounds kind of harsh when we talk about cancelling of people, but you're the best person. Give us a one-on-one -on, -one on what your interpretation of the culture of cancelling is. Well, I think the first thing to say is that it's not a culture in the sense that there's a tradition or a movement or a particular group of people who are involved in this. What the term is used to do is to identify um, a phenomenon which is actually quite an old one in the sense that people have always objected to what others have had to say, how they've represented themselves, what they've chosen to talk about, and people have always tried to both respond to the things they don't like or to stop the things that they don't like. This is why from public authorities we've had censorship. This is why we've had organizations ranging from governments to churches trying to stop people from discussing certain things or talking about certain things. What's a bit unusual now, I think, is that what we're, what we're also seeing is other organizations stepping up to try to prevent discussions. Most um, remarkably, I think, universities have often ended up being places where for a variety of grounds there have been attempts to stop people from coming to speak or stop certain subjects from being discussed, sometimes because of pressure from students, at other times because of fear of a public backlash. That's, I think, a relatively new development, not, in, not entirely because it's not as if universities have never uh, prohibited people from speaking, but it's, it's more noticeable now. Uh, and of course, we're also seeing this much more in evidence because of the prevalence of social media. So people can make their public opinions known or make their opinions known publicly. So what we're living in is a world in which public opinion has much greater immediacy. We know what public reaction is very quickly through Twitter, through Facebook, through Instagram, and so on. That's what's, what's different. But as I said in the beginning, it's, it's not a culture as such. It's not a movement. It's, it's a tendency that we've identified. I think it's good that you, we take time to listen to you and sort of lay the, the groundwork. But I was quite a, a, a bit surprised when you mentioned that it happens even in universities because I, I've always Im had this ima I've imagined universities to be the last place that there would be any sort of restrictions and there would be free speech, so to speak. Yes. Well, it's always been the case that universities have promoted the idea of free speech, of open discussion, inquiry, and so on. But at the same time, universities have always been places where 
controversial speakers have been invited and uh, um, and often disinvited. We're familiar with many cases today, but I can remember when I was an undergraduate at the Australian National University, so this is going back into the, uh, the mid-70s, when um, there was a, a prominent psychologist who was working on, uh, on IQ and race. And there was a huge upcry, uh, out, uh, outcry from the student body. Uh, and I think he eventually was what we would now call uh, deplatformed. Mm -hmm. um, if he spoke at all, there were protests and so on. So it's not a new thing. But I think it's, it's become surprisingly um, common or evident, even perhaps to the extent that there are now you know, comedians, for example, who've said they won't come and speak on campus because things are too sensitive. Okay, so it, there, is a, there is a bit of a shift, I think. I, I think it's probably more in evidence in the countries of, uh, of the West, in, in Australia, in uh, Britain, in the United States. I don't know what it's like and to what extent that happens in, in Europe. I don't see you know, the same sort of evidence of it in, in other parts of the world, but there I just don't know. All right, we'll, we'll delve into this uh, a little deeper. This, this phenomenon that you alluded to has also exploded due to social media's amplifying powers and in society's deep divisions and difficulties redressing some very long-standing inequities um, correct me if I'm wrong, Prof, Prof, but this culture of cancelling has been around, like you said, long before the internet, right, and social media platforms took centre stage. I, th I think that's, that's true. I think um, what we're seeing is greater public awareness of it, in part because, you know, to the extent that these things happened in, in universities, the public was not likely to be, to be aware of it, certainly not uh, you know, 50 years ago. But of course, they would have been um, aware of other forms of censorship, for example, film censorship, or if con controversial films were in fact uh, released, you know, um, The Last Temptation of Christ, for example, banned in many places, uh, Clockwork Orange, banned in many places. In Britain, I think it was only uh, released in around 2010, having been uh, made in the early 1970s. So, those sorts of things I think people have been aware of, but I'm not so sure they would have been aware of you know, campus controversies. Those I think are much, much more in evidence now. All right, I mean, films I can understand because directors, they exercise artistic license, so to speak, and they sort of emphasize <coughs> one part of history more than the other. But I want to come back to this uh, free expression. Some would argue that it's about the right to free expression and democracies celebrate free expression, well, within limits depending on which country you're living in, but at its, at its worst, cancel culture curtails speech. What are your thoughts on that? I would put it slightly differently. There has been a lot of emphasis, of course, on the importance of speech, and in particular, on the importance of freedom of speech for the person who is going to do the speaking. But in some cases, I think what's missed is that what the cancelling does actually is it cancels the listeners. Because let's say you invite someone who's prominent onto campus to, to give a speech about a subject that some people find offensive or just find the person um, in question offensive. If that person is disinvited, it's very unlikely that that person will not be able to speak elsewhere. They'll get other invitations. There are plenty of media opportunities. Twitter gives you more than enough of a platform. So they're not really affected, um, or at least to a very small degree. But the people who are affected are, in fact, the people who would have been in the audience. Now, had they wanted to attend that, had they wanted to have the opportunity to ask questions, to challenge, to confront, that's what's disappearing. And so I think they're sort that's of being deprived of that opportunity to be exposed to another point of view. Yes, yeah, um, or to challenge that point of view. You know, there are, and of course, there are many people who want to listen to what these people have to say. So I think that is the uh, the, the the hidden concern or the the undiscussed concern. And in a way, I I have less um, you know concern or sympathy with many of the speakers because, as, as I've said, they've often got an opportunity to speak elsewhere, but the people who are really being deprived or cancelled by whoever's doing the cancelling 
are the potential audience. I see a point because I mean for the speaker they have various other platforms yes. and they can mm -hmm. they have other avenues but for the audience <coughs> they may not be able to go and find those views because the internet is so huge and there's so many places. Well even if they could find them I mean what they won't be able to do is engage, engage. them because you know there's, there's no Q&A if, uh, if you're reading an article I mean you can make comments on uh, on Twitter or on any of the other platform but no one who's speaking is under any obligation to, to answer you. I, see, if I, you're I hear you. There in front of an audience, you can't just uh, you know, ignore every question that you don't like. Yeah, so f for our friends who are watching this discussion, the culture of cancelling, that's our topic for today. And of course, you're listening to Professor Chandran Kokatas from Singapore Management University. And I want to continue, Prof. There, there is, uh, of course, like you said, the audience who's being deprived of that opportunity to engage. But what about the, the term cancelee themselves? You know, cancel culture can grievously impact the cancelee's professional status. I mean, their livelihoods could end, and one author described it as an endless purgatory, uh, where the debate as to whether those who have been cancelled, uh, should this continue? Should, should their careers be terminated uh, forever without review? So cancellation has become a widespread viral online phenomenon and once you're guilty in the court of public opinion, what next? There's no appeal? There usually isn't any appeal in the, uh, in the court of public opinion because public opinion isn't an institution, it isn't a person, it isn't an authority. There's no, you know, um, there's, there's no agent you can engage when it's public opinion that's that's against you. If uh, if you're boycotted, for example, then there's not a lot you can do to insist that people come and listen to you, or buy your goods, or engage with you in any way. The sense of injustice, I'm sure, comes from the fact that you know, people who are the subject of boycotts or cancellations feel pretty powerless because there's no one to whom you can appeal. Uh, now, in some cases, it may of course be that this is you know, a perfectly justified thing or something that you know, some of us might approve of. In the era of uh, apartheid, you know, many of us um, call for the boycott of South Africa, the end to sporting links with South Africa. It was a political movement that was you know, significant. Yes, and, I, you know, that, I was yeah. a part of this. I thought that that was a good idea. But it was a way of exercising powers and an attempt to shape um, public opinion. But at the same time, there are you know, going to be occasions when people become the victims of public opinion because you know, there are others who are in a way powerful enough to, to mobilize or marshal public opinion and cast them in a light which leaves them very little opportunity to really defend themselves. I don't think there's an easy solution to this, except to say, well, you know, we've got to keep as much as possible the airwaves and the media waves open so that people can either come to their defense or they can defend themselves or they can, can speak out. But there isn't a guarantee here. I mean, this is simply, I think, in the end, the way of the world. It, your reputation depends upon what people think, but that's the one thing you can't control. And so uh, this will be a good opportunity for me to just sort of a, do a gentle reminder. Please do write and share your comments uh, in the comments section and our LCCS production crew here will gather your questions and comments and we'll of course field it to Prof here for his uh, insights. Prof, I want to bring in COVID. Uh, I mean, one of the things that we explored when we put together all the topics for this series uh, is is COVID-19 uh, amplifying this in any way? I mean, has it brought long-standing inequalities into a sharp uh, relief? I think it probably has in some way, simply because the, the pandemic has hit people differently. And as is always the case with, with crises, it, it hits the poor and the vulnerable hardest. In this particular case, clearly, um, you know, many people have lost their livelihoods and those who, who have, who are at the bottom of uh, society's ladder, they're the ones who are, who are hit, uh, hit the hardest. Um, whether it's affected people through the, um, you know, 
the question of the impact on cancelling, I think, is another matter. In one way, I suspect that you know, we would need to do some more research to find this out. I, I suspect that what COVID will have done is strengthen the, um, the importance of social media and uh, our online life, as it were. You know, we're now used to engaging with one another virtually to a much, much greater degree. Uh, this event is obviously being streamed on YouTube rather than being on television, yeah. for example, and it's accessible pretty much anywhere uh, in the world. So that, that medium has become much more powerful. I think that also means that those who have the capacity to, if not control it, at least exert their power and influence through this, this medium, this opportunity, they will gain in, uh, you know, in significance in their capacity to, to, to shape things. Uh, how this is going to play out, I just don't know. I mean, you know, at the end of COVID, things could revert in ways we don't understand. You know, who can say at this point? Well, in some, some would say people have a short memory and it, 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 you know, people might, might forget it. But in a previous uh, a virtual discussion that we had here in the, in the series at LCCS, we did talk about COVID and the anti-Asian and, uh, and the hate and all these things because it's a global uh, impact it's having and that's why I brought COVID up. So do you think there's any um, concern in that area? Mm -hmm. I think there's clearly evidence of this happening, but I don't think COVID is you know, doing anything other than serving as yet another trigger. Um, and there will always be, be triggers for the expression of uh, hate, unhappiness, and so on. Um, I mean, think simply, for example, of uh, um, all the things you heard when the World Trade Center came down in 2001, or when one country invades another, or you know, think of any one of a number of uh, prominent events, uh, you'd always get conspiracy theories arriving uh, and being pushed. Maybe one thing that's becoming more noticeable is that the presence of social media in our lives gives us uh, a kind of opportunity to, you know, to self-isolate in a way, to go into our little cocoons. But, uh, which is not good. Though. Which is not good. But uh, I was actually talking to an American political scientist who works on this subject uh, a couple of days ago, and she said that actually all the evidence in the United States is that despite the, the prevalence of social media, the most powerful medium is still television. As far as news is concerned, that's where 75% of people get their information. Of course, you know, many of us who are active on social media know about what's going on there, but for the vast majority of people, at least in the United States, most of the information comes from television. So, you know, Fox News and MSNBC are much more significant which players is also, than which social media. Which has also media. gone online as well. I mean, mm -hmm. both the traditional broadcasting and, <coughs> and through social media. Uh, Prof, I just want to gently ease us into the next segment. I've, I've called this the weaponization of cancel culture, uh, which is the growing evidence of this. And can we? cancel cancel culture yes well i think one way to think about this is to see <coughs> the um, the activity of of canceling and the objection to canceling and cancel culture as essentially you know different parts of a larger struggle for for power not between specific individuals but you know, among various people and different tendencies. So what's really happening is that even as um, those who are looking to cancel certain activities or deplatform certain speakers, what's happening at the same time is that those who are trying to stop this from happening are in some cases doing this because they object in principle to the canceling, but there are equally others who are objecting to the cancelling, not because they object to cancelling as such, they would probably gladly do the cancelling themselves if they could of other speakers, but this is a way of attacking their opponents. Mm. So I think one shouldn't assume that just because someone is uh, attacking cancelling that you know, they are somehow the representatives of virtue who believe in free speech. 
this is a part of a you know, political engagement. And when you engage with the opponents, you try to um, attack them wherever you can, whether it's because of what they're saying or because of the fact that they are criticizing you for saying what you're saying or because they're stopping someone else from saying what they're saying. All parts of these are riddled with both content and strategies. And so you know, one has to think about it in these terms. But uh, to the skeptics out there who may not be convinced, is weaponization of cancel culture real? Are you concerned? <coughs> Is there I, evidence I, th out there? I think it is real, but what I would caution against is the, the use of the term weaponize, because the, that term is itself loaded. Okay? So um, if I were to say something like, you know, um, I'm using the attack on cancelling as a tactic, um, it doesn't quite sound quite so bad as saying, you know, I'm using, I'm, I'm weaponizing my, my, my tactic. That suddenly you know, conjures up all kinds of other images. It conjures up images of, you know, um, maybe of arms, of violence, and so on. But uh, to say that it's weaponizing is just a, a more dramatic way of saying it's used tactically. All right. But um, I, I came across in my research um, one journalist, uh, Zishan Alim, he has argued that contemporary social media engenders a mode of communication he calls disinterpretation, in which many participants are motivated to join the conversation, not because they want to promote communication or even to engage with that original opinion that has surfaced, but because they seek to intentionally distort the discourse in itself. That's a concern for me, because, but it's also a good uh, argument for more media literacy and for more discussion with students and young people in schools and even a discussion like what we're having today. Um, I think he's right to the extent that there will be some people who will be motivated by this. Um, in politics, there are always people who, you, you know, who might be described as spoilers. You know, their so purpose they intentionally is go into to, you know, It's not peculiar to, to social media. Okay. Um, but I would say that what you'd probably find in social media is uh, a great variety of motivations that people have. You know, when you look at, um, let's say you look at the thread of comments on an article in the newspaper, whether you're reading The Guardian or The Straits Times, you know, they have an, a, a comment section. If you read through, if it's not curated by the editor, you'll see all kinds of stuff. Some of it will be vile, some of it will be um, angry, um, some of it will be clever. Um, but people going into this, they have multiple motivations. Some people just want to get a laugh. You know, they want someone to respond LOL. Uh, they don't really have a stake in anything, but you know, this is what they do. So I'd, I'd be wary of saying that you know, this particular phenomenon of wanting to disrupt is somehow something we should really be worried about. It will be there, there's no, no doubt about that. But you know, in life generally, it's always a challenge to, um, you know, to cut out the noise. There's always more noise than there is anything of substance. That's, that's the perpetual challenge, I think. Good point. Um, we're reaching, fast reaching the midpoint of our, of our conversation here. And so I, I'd like to get your reaction, Prof, to this quote. Why we should cancel the cancel culture? We cannot move forward together if we speak separately and alone. Again, your thoughts? Well, firstly, you, you can't cancel cancel culture. Um, as I said before, it's, it's not as if it's a, a movement. There's nothing there to cancel. Um, if you wanted to have much tighter controls on, on speech, you can to a degree. Governments have been doing it you know, for as long as, uh, as we can remember. You know, the content of speech has always been a subject of regulation to some degree. But at the same time, you know, there are always opportunities for people to, to go underground. You can't control conversations in kitchens. You can't control conversations uh, everywhere. Um, and in that respect, you know, to the extent that, let's say, authorities want to try, the cure could be worse than the disease. Okay? Those who might say we need to cancel, cancel culture might want to ask themselves, you know, who do you want to do the canceling? 
because of course you know what we don't have and that's why we have this phenomenon of cancel culture is disagreement and people disagree not only about the content but whether or not the content is so bad that it shouldn't be expressed in the first place. That's the, the difficulty, I think. And we don't want some central authority to have that power to do the canceling of the cancel culture as well, right? I mean. Well, that authority for certain, but also, you know, I think we want to be wary of uh, private organizations doing this. Now, of course, we've seen that um, with uh, social media uh, platforms from Facebook to Twitter and so on, they have got the capacity to do this. And in, of course, in, there are a couple of things to be said here. One is that these are private organizations. They have their standards that they want to uphold, which is, I think, you know, perfectly reasonable. Just as universities have standards of what kind of speech they will tolerate within their campus. But on the other hand, you know, one would also hope that they would exercise a certain amount of uh, um, you know, discretion that's based on you know, thoughtful, careful judgment. But we can't have any you know, guarantees of this. Probably the most we can hope for is uh, sufficient competition among different platforms, mm -hmm. different forms of social media, different avenues, so that people don't feel like they you know, um, are beholden to any particular source either of information or you know, platform from which they can speak. All right, so um, with the remaining time that we have, I hope you can also guide us uh, with your insights on what's happening on the individual level. We've been talking quite broadly on the big picture, but I mean, the individual is always there in the, in the back of our minds. And for those of you who've just joined us, you're watching the LCCS Real Link 2021, a virtual conversation series that places a spotlight on a range of issues that matter in our society. And it's also about bringing communities together this year, the theme is rebuilding the community. And of course, uh, we hope it's been beneficial to you uh, through this journey that you've embarked with us. I'm Augustine Aswan, and of course today, our special guest speaker, Professor Chandran Kukatas, and we're discussing the culture of cancelling. Uh, Real Link, by the way, is also an LCCS fundraising campaign. So we once again like to seek your support to gift a donation, all right? And the QR code will be on your screen, on the bottom of your screen, as well as in the comment section. You'll be glad to know that your donation is eligible for a one-for-one -one matching as Real Link is part of the Tote Board Enhanced Fundraising Program. All donations, $10 and above, are also eligible for a 250% tax deduction that will go towards supporting LCCS and empowering and engaging individuals and families to build and restore relationships. Prof. I'd like to label the next section the digital divide as we head into the home stretch. And uh, allow me, please, if I can, just to sort of share with you my, what I found out. Social media has suddenly changed the way we communicate, providing more ways to connect than ever before. But in many ways, it's also dividing us and causing us to focus our energy where it isn't always needed. Those are not my words, but picked up from some of the literature that I gleaned through. Again, your thoughts on that? Um, it's very difficult to say exactly where our energies are needed. Now, um, w when I hear statements like this, I, I, I wonder whether you know, people have reflected enough on the fact that you know, human beings have very, very different purposes, not only individually, but collectively. They think you know, very differently about where resources should go, what questions are most urgent, what issues you know, need to be addressed now rather than postponed. Of course, you know, this is not to say that there's, there's no issue here. It has to be debated, discussed, and there will be different views. So you know, I think resources will be diverted to different places you know, at different times. Um, but you know, I think the most one can uh, hope for is that you know, we will be able to persuade each other that certain things are important. But I, I don't think that one can guarantee this and I'm, and I'm not sure that um, you know that social media is somehow directing them in the in the wrong place it's more the people themselves well I think there are other sources of um, you know power that may be um, significant sources of uh, concern because you know in uh, in any society but certainly you can see this in the in the world uh, globally there are particular entities that do wield enormous amounts of power. 
in some cases these are governments, uh, in other cases these are, these are corporations, um, and uh, in some cases these are you know, very, very powerful individuals who right. amass great wealth. In exactly on that point, I mean, we, we briefly touched on this, and the question has just come in, I'm going to read this verbatim, is the lack of a voice, in opening closing with <laughs> the commas, blocked by authority, considered as being cancelled as well? I repeat, is the lack of a voice blocked by authority, considered as being cancelled as well? For example, when the authority does not allow citizen voice. And now, here maybe even the authority could be the state, it could be private sector, who, who also have tremendous uh, influence as well. Again, would you like to weigh in on this? Yes. Um well, you know, to the extent that anyone is prevented from speaking, you could use the term cancelled. Again, the term is not, um, if you like, uh, a kind of uh, term of art. It's not an official definition. It's a label that we've used to uh, identify a certain kind of, uh, you know, a certain kind of practice. But if you are trying to identify the, the phenomenon of you know, preventing others from speaking or communicating so on. you could call it cancel um, I would be disinclined to do so simply for the reason that um, when we talk about cancel culture and the act of cancelling we really have a, a different kind of phenomenon uh, in mind for example we don't think ab about things like uh, libel laws as example of cancel culture okay there, there are laws about libel and slander any kind of defamation of uh, character will, you know, will bring you up before the courts if someone chooses to, uh, to pursue it. Um, and <coughs> essentially what they're saying is, you shouldn't have said this and now you know, you're going to be um, you know, fined or punished or you know, made to pay compensation in, in some way. The threat of, uh, of a suit may stop you from speaking. I wouldn't want to call that cancel, even though that is in fact um, the outcome. You're stopping people from speaking. Yeah, I, I see where you're going with that. Um, well, we, we certainly wish, we hope that we are answering your question. Uh, but like I said, please continue to connect with us and challenge us and send your comments in and questions in. But staying on that point, Prof, uh, again, I picked up another interesting quote here. Uh, Amanda Kuntz, uh, University of Central Florida, uh, professor of sociology. So often we are told we must act and speak out or we are part of the problem and therefore we are not necessarily taught or trained that inaction and not speaking out can be a form of social justice action. At some point we need to think about ways where we can create positive change instead of just fueling uh, negative causes. I, I hope I read that slowly and carefully. Mm -hmm. In other words, instead of all jumping in and adding fuel to this situation, non-action not getting involved, uh, would that work as well? Would that be a good balance, so to speak? Um, I think it may depend on the case. I'm not sure what example she's thinking of because it would be odd if someone were to say, you know, I'm staying in bed tonight and this is my form of, uh, you know, of yeah. action. It's uh, maybe you're just lazy, yeah. okay? Um, but on the other hand, I, I take the point that, you know, not everyone can be an activist. Uh, there may be other things that you're doing that are, you know, contributing to the social good that, that are important. Um, it may be sometimes important that you're making a contribution by, by not jumping on a bandwagon, even if you're not someone who's, uh, you know, um, um, you know, who's got the capacity to, you know, be articulate to talk about the issues at hand, Precisely. or who's not, you know, who's not got the the kind of, you know, fire that wants you, you know, to just jump in and start agitating and so on. I mean, so I wanted to talk about that individual, precisely picking up on that last point. I mean, there are a lot of people who get hurt in the process, even though they may feel they're they're raising a justified cause or speaking on something that is important whether it's inequalities or race or poverty or a range of issues that uh, we are, the, the world is plagued with. Um, and then these, these people, I mean, I, I don't want to put labels on them, they do suffer very strong negative reactions uh, and they suffer 
from losing their jobs just because they spoke up on a cause or mental health concerns. Do you, do you have any reflections on that? Um, the price to pay, so to speak, of the culture. Of yeah, policy. yeah. Uh, well, obviously, n not everyone pays a price, and not everyone pays the same sort of price. Um, you know, we can think of examples, I'm sure, of of people who who revel in the notoriety that that comes with speaking out, and uh, uh, for them, it's not about the the jobs, it's not about the money, it's about the the display. Okay. On the other hand, there are you know clearly um, people who have become victims because they've said maybe just one thing which has been taken in a way they didn't intend and now suddenly the whole world you know, jumps all over them. Now sometimes it may even be something that they shouldn't have said but you know, who can uh, be so you know, controlled that you never let slip anything. Uh, and I think that is really um, unfortunate and that is something that I think is amplified by the kind of world we live in, the fact that we live in a world where you know, social media means that we can react to everything so quickly. I think that, that is a real... Yeah, know, that, that's exactly what tragedy. I picked up. If, if something comes on your timeline or your feed on your smartphone or your device and it's outrageous or terrible, we often have this knee-jerk reaction, you know, and uh, rather than investigating the issues or listening, we sort of just go there and then we share so much stuff online we have a tendency sometimes to say things via social media or other platforms that we wouldn't say face to face with someone. I think that's very true. In fact, I think there are two aspects of this. One of it, of course, is that um, when you're not face to face but you're anonymous, um, you've got much more, um, you're much more emboldened. Okay? So that's, that's one concern. But the other thing, which is also a part of what you mentioned, is that um, you know, we're very likely to be moved by the first thing we hear, especially if it's a, it's a, if it's a case of injustice. I, I, I know from the years that I spent as the warden of a, of a university college that I often had to feel you know, students' complaints, and often these were complaints about the other student. And the first student who comes to you always has you know, a, a story that makes you feel some sympathy. And when you feel sympathy for the student, you feel you know, annoyance at least at the other student yeah. being complained about. But then of course if you actually speak to the other student you get another side and suddenly you see that okay, um, either I'm not so sure about matters or maybe actually I think the second student has a, has a, has a, you know, has a better case. With social media, I think it's so much more difficult for this to, to happen, yeah, so you know? It, it, pardon me for jumping in. So if we're coming back a full circle, and I'm, I'm mindful of the time here, is exactly what you said. I mean, if that person was denied that opportunity to speak in university, there's no opportunity for engagement. I mean, they could find other avenues to speak, right? But that whole interaction is lost. I yeah. mean, even with COVID and virtual, you could still post questions and challenge that opinion. And Precisely that, I've just got another question that has just been passed to me. I'm going to read this verbatim, Prof. Thank you. First time hearing about the culture of cancelling. So that's good. We're on track. Where can this concept be included in school curriculum development? Now, I have to tell you, Prof, I'm a little bit biased on this because I'm a strong advocate of media literacy, media education, getting young people to think about this, critical thinking questions. But you're the dean of a university. Yes, yes. Um, well, I think there are you know, classes, subjects where this would be an appropriate thing to, to talk about. Certainly in, uh, in high school, I would think that in any, let's say, a kind of civics class, but also in any class where you discuss the, the events of the day, what, this is what, something... What about children? I mean, teenagers, sure, I think it's important to bring that into their lives. But what about children themselves? I mean, they're also pretty much using these devices a little bit of cultural cancelling. Yes, I, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, how young you, you have in mind when you no, think of children. Yes. Yes. So, you know, I, I think, um, you know, kids who are pre-teens, I think you probably should just, you know, leave them to develop. Right, I mean, there are lots of aspects I to know. their upbringing you need to think about. I think as we get older 
and we can actually engage in a more sophisticated I way, point, yeah. then it's uh, important to start thinking about these things to make people aware of, uh, uh, of you know, these uh, aspects of the way in which they engage. So if I, if I, I want to paraphrase you correctly, and, and again in view of time, so to the, to the viewer who posed the question, you're basically advocating that this should be brought into a teen curriculum, 13 to 16, 18 years of age? You know, I, I wouldn't want to go be so prescriptive uh, as that. It's, I, I wouldn't even necessarily want to say what we should do is, let's say, have classes on cancelling and cancel culture. I think what we should be doing more generally is simply talking about the question of uh, freedom of speech. Uh, how important a freedom is this? What does it mean? We need to understand that um, simply saying free speech doesn't tell us a great deal because like any that. societies always have certain restrictions of what we can do, what we can say, how we can dress, how we can present ourselves. But we need to, I think, ask some serious questions about what underpins this? Um, what are the limits that we you know, should consider? Um, I think those things should be talked about. And in that context, I think something like the topic of cancel culture cancelling, deplatforming, all of these things can uh, arise as instances of this larger question. Well, I hope it's, it, it's uh, answering your question to our, to our friends uh, in the virtual world. Uh, please do bring this under the larger discussion of uh, freedom of speech. Uh, did I quote you correctly, yes, Prof? Yes. Yeah. So, Prof, it's a perfect segue to our closing uh, segment. And as always, I, I like to label this simply as the way forward. Um, Cancel culture begins when a person uses their voice to pass judgment on another. Often, well, I personally believe this, while operating with limited or even distorted information. I'd like you, Prof, to, I mean, building on what you've just recommended to that earlier question, what else should we be doing, exploring, as we move to the final stages of our discussion? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing to note is that we can't stop people passing judgment. Uh, that's, I think, in our DNA, and nothing is, uh, is going to change that. Moreover, I think we don't want to change that because we need to make judgments not only of uh, things, but we need to make judgments about other people. Otherwise, we wouldn't be moral beings, you know, we, and we only learn how to become moral beings by communicating and that means passing judgment saying no don't do that that's a bad thing to do so um, the, the, that's the, the, the T word is on the tip of my tongue because you've written on toleration as well so yes I, yes is, is well I think toleration is a very important part of that but but also you know engaging uh, constructively is is important the problem of course always is going to be that there are different views about you know what is constructive engagement, what things can and cannot be said. So the, um, the issue of free speech is itself a part, of, uh, a part of speech. What I would be most worried about is if we get to a point in any society where um, the extent of cancelling, deplatforming makes it even difficult to talk about these things. Um, you know, what I would like to make sure that we see is people engaging on the substance of the issues rather than talking about who should or should not be allowed to speak. Which is not to go so far as to say, you know, you should never stop anybody from speaking because, you know, there are sometimes good reasons to stop someone from speaking. Sure. You don't want someone who's going to incite a riot. You don't want someone who's saying things that, um, you know, um, are not just going to be offensive, but are going to be harmful and dangerous. But you know, the, 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 the worry is always that people in power or in authority will use that caution as a reason to cancel or to shut down Altogether. even more people. Yeah. And you know, I think this is a constant battle. We'll, we'll never resolve it. At certain points, I think we need to stand up and and argue very, very strongly for speech, free speech. And I think, I think this may be a time when that's important because of uh, you know, the prevalence of certain sorts of uh, tendencies. Um, but you know, the pendulum will swing. But I like what you said earlier, and COVID or no COVID, also try to do it as far as possible face-to-face, -face, 
that, that human interaction, that engagement is important as well, rather than hiding behind the keyboard or something yeah. else? Well, you know, it's well known that um, people take very different decisions when they meet face to face. You know, the, the way an employer treats an employee can be very different if it's on email um, as against, um, you know, face to face, you know, with one, when one person comes into the room and says, hey, I want to talk about this. If you're um, not even anonymous, but simply at a certain remove, it changes the dynamic. It changes also, you know, the, uh, uh, the way in which you feel empowered. And sometimes you don't want people to be empowered because if you're empowered, it also gives you um, occasion to be a little bit less distress, a bit a little bit less respectful, a little bit less caring, and so on. So you know, these are all subtleties that you know we need to be mindful of. Well, you've definitely raised uh, so many points. I think we just wish we would have more time. We must invite you back for another session. But I do have one final um, piece of research I picked up. It was actually in the 2020 Forbes article. Um, quite a few illuminating inquiries towards the culture of accountability under this broad discussion of cultural cancelling. And they came up with a couple of questions. I've just pulled out two or three that I thought spoke to me. Question one, do I examine the full story before speaking out? If we could ask this question ourselves, I mean, the world might, might be a better place. If I feel overwhelmed, do I take time to process before responding? That's another question I picked up. And finally, one, uh, one more here. Have I given myself and others the freedom to not be right? <laughs> I don't know. But on that note, Prof, these were just a few questions I pulled out. I think what I'm trying to drive at here in our closing stages is I mean, if we went back to that earlier question about school curriculum, it would be nice if we can come up with a whole set of critical thinking questions, right? Mm -hmm. we pay, paste on our fridge door. So every time we open the fridge and we close it, we look at this and we ask ourselves before we jump into this whole culture of cancelling. Does it, would it work? Um, I, I think that the last point um, you made is very important. You know, we should um, be more mindful of the fact that not only are other people wrong, but maybe they have the right to be wrong. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that they've got the right to do or say anything they want. Sure. But, um, you know, one good thing about other people being wrong is that you can feel that you're right, okay? But even aside from that little bit of uh, satisfaction, I think we should get used to the fact that, you know, um, that other people can be wrong, and that's okay. Um, you know, not feel the need to try to, you know, fix everything that's, that's wrong in the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's never going to happen and it's only going to make you unhappy. All right, Prof. Uh, we're not closing yet, but uh, it's usually at this stage I have a little tradition and I'm going to pick this up here and, and just walk this through. So for the rest of you at, at home, we can see this, you know. This is called Fables Talk and Prof, this is going to come to you soon. It's a token of appreciation. As we come towards the end of the discussion, we'd also like to show our appreciation to our guest speaker, Professor Chandran Kokatas, for joining us and for sharing his insights. Um, this is actually a deck of cards, and you will find stories that exemplify uh, LCCS's uh, working principles. And they've also got some questions at the back on, uh, for reflection. So we alluded to some of these uh, principles in our conversation today, and even in our previous uh, sessions, all of which are available online. It's all about respecting individuals' voice space and also relational inclusion. So, Prof, this uh, e-book fables talk, uh, but you'll be getting the actual version. Am I right? Uh, we will be getting the actual version, Henry. So, this will be ready um, in uh, September this year. So, please do keep a, keep a lookout for this Thank one. Thank you very right? much. It's called fables talk. It will be coming to you. But, Prof, in our final uh, closing part of our program, I mean, as part of the, my role as a moderator is to do the research, and I hope I, I got a pass grade from you. Definitely, <laughs> yeah. But uh, is there a question that we have not asked so far, and you feel that you know, there are other areas that we should be exploring under this larger discussion of the, the culture of cancelling? Ah. What else would you like us to think and send us home with something to think about as well? Yeah. Well, maybe I'd go back to something you raised very briefly um, referring to some of my own uh, work and that's the 
the idea of toleration. Yes. So let me put a uh, slightly provocative um, thought you know, to everyone, and that is that um, um, particularly among philosophers and ethicists, a great deal of emphasis is put on the, the idea of justice. You must make sure that society is, is just. And this is something that I think can be a can be a cause of concern or even trouble because to the extent that one thinks that justice is most important and one thinks that one's own views about what is just uh, are the correct views, what you'll get is simply conflict among people. And to the extent that they say things like, you know, um, no peace without justice, what they're really doing is they're setting down a very, very demanding standard, and one that cannot be met if the two or three contending sides have different views about justice. Okay? Uh, this is just another way of saying, perhaps we shouldn't be so um, concerned about what we think is right. Dogmatic? Okay? Dogmatic, um, but also just, um, you know, because we, th we know that what is right is what we're you know, um, we're always, at least in principle, striving for, that we then take a particular attitude to those we think are not right, okay? Because nothing can be done unless they fix their behavior, unless they start acting rightly. Uh, and I think what we've got to start learning to accept a bit better is that, um, you know, there are different views about this. Now, this is not to say, okay, I'm just going to be a skeptic or, I'm going to be a relativist and, and everything goes. But I think what it means is being more willing to step back and say, okay, let me take a more tolerant attitude and more tolerant outlook. Because I know that different views about what is just, what is right, can't all be rec reconciled. Okay? And so you know, we need to think a little bit more about how we get along given that we disagree. And the answer that says, well, we'll get along once we've sorted out what's just, I think is a mistake. Um, but I think it's a mistake that's, that's evident in a lot of ethical thinking. Oh, I think that's a, a beautiful place to leave our conversation at. It's certainly not the end, uh, but I, 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 I can hear what you're saying. It's not just two groups of people. I mean, sometimes it's even within a family. Uh, family members may have different positions. Anyway. I'm tempted to say more and ask more, but uh, we need to bring this to a close. So that's all the time we have for this panel discussion. Please do join me in thanking Professor Chandran Kukatas for his sharing, and of course, all of you for your participation and your questions that you fielded to us. Uh, do let us know what, we, what you think of our program, and we are serious about this. You can leave your comments, you can challenge us and help us uh, make this series better, and we can connect, it with, uh, connect with you. And as a final reminder, uh, we sincerely hope you can support our campaign by donating generously using the QR code that is appearing on your screen. And we'd also like to call your attention to our next Real Link virtual conversation session that's happening on Friday, Prof, on the 3rd of September, same time, 7.30 p.m. And our guest speaker will be Deepa Swaminathan. Deepa Swaminathan. And we'll be exploring foreign workers' forgotten heroes. And until then, from all of us here, the LCCS team, the production team, the production crew, and of course, Professor, uh, we say, stay with us. The journey continues. I'm Augustine Athwan. Thank you so much for being part of this Real Link virtual conversation series. Bye for now.